Hi, I'm uh, John Irvine. I was the school consultant psychologist here at Central Coast Grammar School for 20 years and I have the privilege of anchoring this video. This is the first time we've ever had the pioneers all get together and share their history and uh, it's pretty rich indeed as we head up for our 35th uh, anniversary. What we see now when we look around the school, we've got this Performing Arts Centre, Richard Lawney Centre, new science lab. We've got the new junior school making its appearance. We've got excellent playing fields. We've got that remembrance lake. We've got so many wonderful facilities that I think most of them knew except for maybe the entrance gate was probably the only thing that uh, still survives from those early days. So, but how did it start? Where did it get started? How would something as magic as the grammar school has become with such a wonderful, proud performance in so many areas. How did it get started? Well, we have the privilege today of having some of those pioneers here. I'm going to introduce each of them and then they're going to talk about those early days. We have Len Chambers, who was a real estate developer and on council from 85 to 90. We have Jeff Cooley, a paediatrician who was on council from uh, 85 to 89. We have uh, Judy Stokes, who is a GP, and she also was on council from, I think it was 95 to 2004, but she was actually chairman from 2001 to 2004 of the board. And of course, we have Richard Lorney. He was at the school right at the outset as the deputy principal, deputy headmaster, but then he became the principal in uh, the headmaster in 1988 until 2008. They're all here today, and we're going to get their memories, their recollections of how it all began. I think it came about because quite a few of us at the time were concerned that our children were getting older and that uh, the schools in Gosford were varied, and we were finding that quite a few of our colleagues were sending their children to Sydney to go to school when they got to high school, and we didn't want that. My first recollection is that um, our families had lunch at Len's place in, in uh, 1979, I think it was, uh, probably early 1979. We talked about the future. Our children were very young and we talked about what would happen and we thought, why don't we, why don't we build a school? <laughs> you know, just, you know, it seemed so easy at the time just to build a school and, you know, good idea. Um, but in fact, it was obviously much harder than that. Um, we talked about it. We didn't do much about it at the time. I've got a letter that we wrote to um, Pittwater House School in Sydney in September that year where we asked about whether they would be interested in starting a branch of their school in Gosford uh, and they said no. And I think over the next three or four years we talked about it every six months or so we, we said how's it going with the school and, and we were still looking. We looked at um, uh, sites at, uh, at Kincumber, we talked to the Greenpoint Baptist School, we, we, we talked to the state system of schooling and they tried to encourage us to improve the state system rather than look at a different school. So from 79 until probably 83 it was talked about but, but nothing actually happened. You need to remember that, that was in a time when Gosford was changing from being a holiday area to a proper growth area. Uh, I came to Gosford at the end of 74 and, and it was still just beyond the cottage hospital, just beyond the GP hospital then, so very few specialists and, and so the whole area was just developing at that time and there was an increasing professional base that wanted something different in the school. The memories really started with two families who were friends. Myself, my wife Virginia, Jeff Pewley and his wife Jane. Each of us had small children and we discussed often where we'd send them to school. I'd been to a local selective high school and I was disappointed, very disappointed, at the fact that one of my teachers had passion and enthusiasm and the others didn't. I was determined that my kids had teachers who were inspiring and that determination was so powerful that we thought we would maybe send them to Sydney, the Sydney schools, but we wanted them to live at home. The travel was impossible. Jeff's family and mine talked often and we discussed where we'd send them and we decided after a tremendous number of discussions and research by Jeff, by Jeff Curley, that we'd build it. 
and we did. I should add one thing that is important. My wife, Virginia, then heard a radio program about a headmaster who'd started a school in Northholme, who had the same name as ours by coincidence, and she phoned the wife of the headmaster on many occasions, Margaret Chambers, and that was the beginning of Ron, her husband, our first headmaster, Ron Chambers, and Margaret coming to Central Coast and meeting us over a lots of red wine where we put a big whiteboard up behind us with dozens of little blank sheets of paper and dozens of magnets. And plying them with red wine, we asked them to talk about every action they'd taken previously in starting another school. We wrote every separate action on a bit of paper. We put it on the whiteboard behind us. And then we gathered all those pieces of paper into a logical timeline sequence. And, and I repeat, lots of red wine later, we had the skeleton on the board behind us of starting a new school. And that's how we made it happen. Well, I think we first got involved um, based on young Emily Cooley, to be honest. We saw a young girl dressed in a beautiful uniform at the end of our street when we first arrived on the Central Coast in 1986, the year after the school had started. And I was so impressed by this little girl in her uniform that I actually, we, my husband and I went to the little cottage that was where the grandstand is now. And we booked out four children, in, or at that stage two children, into the school for the future. And we were so impressed, even in those early days, we went to some early country fairs, as they called them then. And again, the um, passion that was evident among the staff and the teachers was what we were looking for in a school. And, and that's how we first became involved. And so from there, uh, our children started at the school and then later I, I was on the board, part of the PNF, and then on the board, and then became chairman. But by the time that happened, the school was well underway. And looking back, I can see what opposition those early leaders met with in getting the school going, and the risk they took. Uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge and thank them, John, for, for what they did. It was, you know, Len and um, Virginia, and Jeff and Jane, with Ron and Margaret Chambers, and, and then of course Richard coming along, and then the early boards under uh, Bill Elliott's leadership and then Brian Hilton's leadership, they took enormous risks to do what they did. And they embraced new parents that came into the school. They got together, they had working bees. You know, I remember the parents digging trenches and drains down on the rugby oval to drain it. Um, to try and save the flooding happening on the rugby fields. I remember, I remember the parents building that grandstand and clearing the bush and there were working bees and I remember them collecting two dollar coins to raise money for the buildings. So you know there were the leaders of the school, the headmaster, his staff also putting in the grit and determination to get it up and running and, and those parents and the students too who were very enthusiastic uh, to make it work. And so I really want to thank them um, for what they did. Uh, it was an enormous effort. And so by the time I got there, the, the financial and the business side of things had really been taken good care of. And, and I came in really with the school that was well underway. And I'd just like to acknowledge and thank those um, pioneers really, who had perseverance and passion and, and got it up and running. And how grateful I am to them and our family is to them and uh, I feel very, very privileged and honoured to be, have been part of that process subsequently and to see the school where it is today and to be still involved 30 years later. Um, I feel so fortunate and, you know, it's, it's a wonderful school. It really is inspirational and how marvellous it, it has been to see that happen. And if I can add one more thing, um, I think having some memories of those early days and, and acknowledging and bearing in mind those founding fathers are still with us, some of them, some are absent obviously, but some are here. I think to have been able to get an archive committee up and running and to have this video I think is so special and, and I'd like to acknowledge you John for getting this up and going and also Christine Hodgson 
and Bill Lowe at the school for, for letting this happen because I think it's something that will be forever in the archives and something very precious for the school to have for the future. We got families involved because uh, uh, once we had the, the, the basic school board involved, um, we then needed to get families involved to make it worthwhile, to make it happen. We got families involved by advertising in the newspapers in the early 1984 and uh, we put out a, a, a little uh, uh, flyer saying that the grammar school will open in, in next year and from that quite a, a lot of families involved, uh, became involved and, and uh, some didn't go the distance but quite a few did and from there we were able to get a nucleus of families who put up an initial loan and that kick-started the school. How did we get parents involved? The first thing we did was to make a decision to create the prospectus, to have printed the whole of the school's purpose, to decide on a start date, which was very, very close. And we had something in our minds that was absolutely complete. We then advertised in the local newspapers with a little coupon asking any interested parent to send in the coupon. So a great number of the coupons came in. I imagine they were about that thick on the desk, several hundred. And we set about phoning every single parent to discuss it. Most parents said, gee, this is great news. We're very interested. We want to send our kids locally. We'd rather be local than Sydney. We'll wait till the school gets built and we'll see how it goes. And then we'll make a decision. That process had to be short-circuited. You can't start a school costing millions unless you have students enrolled. How do we get the money to start it? We appointed to our school board Mr Ed Manners, who was the uh, manager and owner of a local newspaper, but who had spent the previous eight years as Mr Kerry Packer's financial controller. Ed was a brilliant economist, and he said, as far as the start-up's concerned, I'll fix it. And we said, how? He said, we'll hire a hall, and we'll invite every parent who sent in a coupon to come to the hall, and they did. And Ed Manners stood up and said, my first piece of research, ladies and gentlemen, is that there isn't one independent school in Australia that's ever gone bankrupt. The audience was hushed. It was a surprise. He said, the one thing you need to do is as you leave, there's a desk at the door with a, a girl there ready to, t to help you. Just sign a bank guarantee, a piece of paper that you, where you will get from your bank a bank guarantee in favour of the Central Coast Grammar School, no money, just a bank guarantee that in the unlikely event that the school fails economically, your guarantee will be met, which was quite a small amount of money, I think something like $1,000 and we ended up with an enormous number of bank guarantees which we took to our bank and the bank that is absolute security for the bank. It was a brilliant, brilliant move and without it I do not know how we would have funded the school. We looked at sites at Narara and at Lizaro and we put pins on a map as I recall uh, to look at where the parents who we had who had expressed an interest in the school had come from. And we found that the most central spot was, was Erina. Um, so we, we looked further at Erina and um, the current site came up. Uh, but we had looked at you know, a, a wide range of sites um, be, before that over, over quite a period of time. We looked around the coast. There was, it had to be the right zoning. Unfortunately, we couldn't just choose a nice piece of land and say that'll do. It had to be the right zoning. There are only several options that we could find. One was a large property at Arimba. The other one was at Narara. And I think there was one at Womberall. And there was the site at Erina. So we chose the six acre site at Erina. 
which was central to many of the parents who'd be sending their kids to the school. I was directly involved in trying to find the right headmaster and, and that happened because Len had contact with Ron Chambers and uh, he and his wife Margaret came up to lunch and from there we decided that Ron was the right person to be the founding headmaster and from there he formed the, the first nucleus of, the, of other staff. The other staff initially involved finding the rest of the school council and Ron suggested um, Bill Elliott as the, as the chairman and Graham Bennett as the treasurer. And that was a very useful, useful group. And some of those early council meetings were, were, were very uh, dynamic and interesting and, and some of the most exciting meetings I've ever been to, I think. Um, but from that, Ron selected Richard Lawney as the, as, the head, as the deputy. And I think they both chose the rest of the, of the initial um, school staff. That initial school staff came with a big leap of faith because they, they had jobs elsewhere and they were coming to a, a school which didn't exist and they left their previous jobs and came to that school with a great leap of faith. How did we select the right staff to make it so successful? Firstly, the choice of headmaster. The initial headmaster, Ron Chambers, was dynamic, enthusiastic, had incredible drive, and experienced the start of school. He was inspiring and he was, his energy was enormous. And he put together an extremely talented group of initial teachers. To his great credit, and in particular, Richard Lawney, the Deputy Headmaster, carried on to create a school of remarkable depth and quality. So that original Headmaster was the key. Well, it wasn't really a case of we selecting the staff, it was very much a case of Ron. So. Uh, in the first instance, Ron Chambers operating from his Man Street office, uh, aided and abetted by Robin Burke, uh, chose the, the staff. So this was in the second half of, uh, of 1984. He began by appointing some key people and then we had a staff meeting, I remember, at Ron's house in Warunga and that was the first time that we'd all met each other. So that was quite a, an important occasion. Uh, that was on Remembrance Day. The first staff member, by the way, was, was Peter Brandon. If we discount Robin Burke, uh, who was working with Ron, Peter Brandon was the first staff member appointed. Ron made some very good appointments. Others turned out to be less happy for, for both parties. You know, signing up staff to a school that didn't even exist is not an easy exercise. Uh, it was an act of faith for, for both parties, for the school and for the, the new staff. By definition, Ron was taking on people who were prepared to take a risk, uh, people who were unafraid of change, people who were unafraid of the unknown, and people who were unafraid of hard work because um, there was a lot of hard work and a lot of uncertainty in those, in those early days. Some of the new people were Central Coast residents. Um, some of them were commuting to Sydney. Others were in local schools and wanting a change. Others, like John Terry, for example, were, were known to, to Ron. And uh, sometimes it worked out, and sometimes uh, it worked out less well. Once the school had finally opened, the recruitment process was opened up. Um, I was much more involved at that stage and other staff members, senior staff, as needed from time to time. I made the point before that the early staff worked exceedingly hard. Um, might be worth pointing out that everyone had about three jobs. So Peter Chudley, for example, who was the senior master, that's number three in the hierarchy, was also the Nikolai house master the head of maths and in charge of the timetable. Kevin Reddy was similarly loaded up. John Bosenberg was similarly loaded up. We all had two or three big jobs to do. The expectations were enormous. The hours were very demanding. Ron used to have staff meetings, which used to go on till late at night. And you know, in the early days at staff meetings, we would discuss every single student 
in the school. So if you were sitting there wanting to talk about students in year 11, you had to listen first of all to every other student being discussed. And you had to be very patient indeed to uh, survive those, those staff meetings. The new staff, almost without exception, were very strong individuals, ambitious, each with their own agenda, and each with their own ideas of how the school should work. So developing a strong team with some degree of unity of purpose was no easy task. And from the very start, I saw that that was my job, to try and achieve some sort of unity of purpose. Ron's own appointment, I think, was a master stroke on the part of the board. He was the right man for the job. In my eulogy for Ron, if I could just quote, I said this, founding a new independent school on the Central Coast may have been regarded as impossible by ordinary men's standards. But Ron Chambers was not an ordinary man. He had a very clear vision of what he wanted to do. And more than anybody else, he was responsible for the creation of this school. Others, of course, played their part. A site had to be chosen, plans drawn up, buildings erected. But a school is far more than land, bricks and mortar. A school needs a soul to bring it to life. And Ron Chambers, to my mind, must be credited with the creation of this school's soul. The head of a school, for better or worse, is the person who has the most influence over what that place becomes. And our patron, Jim Wilson Hogg, said this about that on Foundation Day in 1985. What the head does will be of immense importance. What he is will be of even greater moment. What he is will determine the feeling, the ambiance, the ethos of the school, and hence its destiny. Well, the interim arrangements have been much talked about, John. We often hear about the Avoca days as if we were there for months. Uh, in fact, we were there for two days, um, February 6, February 7. We occupied the surf club and we occupied the cinema. Uh, the kids had a wonderful time because there wasn't a great deal of control. I remember at the first assembly in the cinema, having to lay the law down about how we behaved at a grammar school. That's when I developed my scowl. The selection of the first cohort of children was very much Ron's job. Um, so once again, operating from 353 Man Street, um, and then later from the cottage at the grammar school site, Ron recruited students for years 3 to 11. There were 185 students, by the way, at Avoca Beach. I'm not sure if select is the right word. New schools need bottoms on seats. Um, and selection procedures need to be, let's say, flexible. It's not quite a case of if you can pay the fees you're in, but it's close. Some of the students in our first year 10 didn't really want to be there. There were only 10 to start off with, and quite a few left at the end of the year. Some of the initial year 11s weren't too keen on being there either, but they soon changed their minds and became a great group. We struggled to find enough students for year eight. We only had 17 at Avoca Beach and only one girl, Paulette Smith, who unfortunately didn't survive the year. Some students couldn't afford the fees, parents couldn't afford the fees, and uh, a place back then in year 11 was $3,080 per annum. Free places were, were available, and the first one, I think, the first true scholarship went to George Bartlett in, in year 11, which was a great decision. And then later on that year, after the Easter break, we commenced with a, a year two class as well. The early board meetings were quite dynamic. We had highly energised people, a headmaster with enormous enthusiasm. The secret was a small committee of complementary people and quick decisions without too much debate. Holding harmony was a key issue because lots of things can bring a new school off the rails. We all have an ego, we all have ideas, 
It's very important that someone is helping everyone else within the small group be heard, have a contribution and to stay even. And uh, that process at Central Coast Grammar School has been carried on quite brilliantly uh, in latter years. With us today is Judy Stokes, Dr Judy Stokes who was Chairman of the Board and did a remarkable job in harmonising everybody's different interests, including the PNF school board members, to a wonderful result, supporting Richard Lawney, who was the quite brilliant headmaster for so long. The facilities in the early days, well, I suppose the glib response is we didn't have many. Um, but in fact, that's not true. Um, the basics were well provided for. Ron used to always talk about GPLAs, classrooms, general purpose learning areas. And we have plenty of those. We had two science labs. We had the additional heritage buildings. Um, there's a lovely drawing on page 17 of the foundation yearbook by year 10 student Nicole Bradley. And it clearly shows the stage one with the buildings coming down the, the side of the hill. At the end of every lesson, a bell used to be sounded. It was an empty oxygen cylinder on a metal tripod. And a student who was the bell monitor would hit it with a hammer. So all we had was classrooms. There were no specialist facilities other than, of course, the original family home on the site, which was where Ron had his office. I had my office. That's where we had the, the common room and the sick bay. Um, and then outside the the original house, there was a, a canteen, which was a caravan, and there was a family-sized swimming pool, um, which was heavily used by uh, the school community. The library in those days was a classroom. PE and art were in heritage rooms. The assembly area was the prep playground. Bring your own chair. Papers flying everywhere on a windy day. And uh, in Anna Dukakis's history of the school, she chronicles the growth in their teaching facilities very well indeed as we gradually work towards the magnificent facilities that the students enjoy today. The children were able to use a number of areas for, for play and, and recreation in those early days. I previously referred to the, the swimming pool which was heavily used. Uh, Peter Brandon in the first year had an active sports program using whatever facilities he, he could find. And the following year, uh, Bob Lloyd devised a very ambitious program whereby we bust students out of the school to different locations. We had the use of Paul Oval, which was just a short walk away. Um, for regular playground time, the students had their own little zones. They kept very much to their own year group, year 11 up at the top, working down to the prep down at the bottom. And it was in those early days that handball became the pastime of choice at recess and lunchtime. I think it's still being played today. There was never really any feeling that we were short of playground space. Tuck shop and canteen, I have to confess to a certain haziness about the the, the, the early stages of its development. I'm pretty sure that we did have a, an old caravan behind the cottage, which was where we operated a canteen from. I remember that for a while, we had a couple of, uh, a young couple ran it, and they wanted to have a healthy canteen, and sales plummeted. And so we had to revise our concept of, of what was healthy and what wasn't healthy, because sales matter. Later on, we moved the canteen to the Science Undercroft and then sometime after that it moved to its current location at the other end of the, of the Undercroft. I'm pretty sure that Sandy Reynolds was involved with the canteen in the early days. Pat Evans ran it for some time and then uh, Lynn Lockman took it over. Lynn Lockman had previously run the, the clothing shop Canary Corner. Um, and I actually recruited Lynn early in the piece. She was working at Grace Brothers uh, in Gosford, 
which was the supplier of the school uniforms. And I was so impressed when I went to buy a uniform for my daughter, Bonnie, that I ended up persuading her to come and work at the grammar school, and she's been there ever since. Jeff Curley's wife, Jane, and uh, my ex-wife, Virginia, and Margaret Chambers, that's the headmaster's wife, all got together, looked at all the best of Sydney's uniforms. In particular, I remember them deciding against the tide at the time on broad-brimmed hats to save the sun. And uh, their uniform um, is quite lovely and uh, is exactly the same today. For many of our new students, wearing a uniform was something they'd never had to do before. And uh, the, the origins, uh, I think we owe to, to, to Margaret and to Virginia Chambers and, and Jane Cooley. It was my job to make sure that the uniform was worn correctly. And uh, <clears throat> Ron certainly was um, very strict about how the uniform should be worn. As I've said, some students didn't really like wearing the uniform. I mentioned earlier the name George Bartlett, our first scholarship student. He was a very large boy. He was a rugby league player for Parramatta. And he lived in Woi Woi. He used to catch the train from Gosford to Woi Woi. And he used to be our representative, shall we say, of the platform to make sure that our students were wearing the uniform. And he would discourage students from other schools from teasing uh, our boys and girls as well. He was very good at doing that sort of thing. But yes, Ron was strict. Um, it was blazers on all the time, unless it was about 40 degrees. And I remember one day, very early on in the piece, when the general duties man, Gary Glenn, a very good friend of mine, and I, decided that um, the students could have blazers off when they left the school and Ron found out and we were dragged into his office and told that it was the headmaster's job to make decisions about blazers on and blazers off and nobody else's job and did we understand and we had to say yes we understand. The school logo was, was Ron's Chambers idea and approved by the council but it was based on the, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life as the two trees and um, later on the house the houses were based on Australian wildlife uh, trees, uh, ironbark and nikolai and the like. Well the ethos of the, ethos of the school was, was something we talked about a lot uh, and I think both Len and I had been, had been to state schools and uh, so we weren't particularly private school people at all and in, 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 the, in the initial prospectus you'll see that one in 25 children were there on a scholarship so we very much were encouraging people from all walks of life as much as possible within the, in the private sector. We very much wanted a school of, of good values, a high, of high ethics, of a school that would um, help children from all walks of life and across all range of abilities and be encouraged in, in, in the best way. Uh, a school of integrity and a school where, where everyone did their best and, and that came through very strongly in those early years particularly, I felt, with the, with the style of teachers and the leadership from the top. Christian values at the school. We're talking here about a very important question, John. One of the very first staff members once asked me why we had a weekly service. Funny question was my answer. And I continued, well, we are a non-denominational Christian school. Oh, he said, I thought that non-denominational meant non-Christian. So putting that to one side for the moment, you have asked a key question. To my mind, this is one of the most important questions asked today because it's the underlying ethos of what used to be known as caring and sharing that was brought about by Ron's vision of Christian ethos. And really, to truly understand Central Coast Grammar School, I don't think we can separate the Christian ethos from the house system. It's all about caring for others. And you'll see that, for example, in the school reading, which Ron chose, John 10, 7 to 13, which concludes, the hired man runs away because he's only a hired man and doesn't care about the sheep. I won't read it in full, 
But then the school charter is also quite explicit about the Christian values of the school. The original school charter said, the school will follow and promote the Christian ethos, but will not be evangelical in emphasis, nor denominational. Basing teachings will incorporate honesty, personal integrity, and care for others. The Bible will be studied during one period each week, and a service of worship held each week. Now, Ron was adamant from the start that the school would not be seen as evangelical. Uh, for example, he, he stopped um, a particular teacher from starting lessons with a prayer, and he insisted that creationism had no place in the science labs. So he had his very particular view of what the Christian ethos meant for the school. For some of the founding staff, the school was too religious, and for others, it wasn't religious enough. For some of the founding parents and their children, the school was too religious. And for others, it wasn't religious enough. There was a school survey done in 2002 to try and update and clarify the school's position because many parents had identified the Christian ethos as an issue. For the majority, I think it was a, a Goldilocks issue. It was just right. But there were always those who wanted to make it more religious and those who would like to see it as a secular school. In talking about the Christian ethos, we have to talk about the school ethos, and that leads us to the central role played on the very first day of pastoral care, the house system and the house families. From the very start, my job was about establishing Ron's vision. And where that blueprint didn't quite deliver what was intended, it was up to me to make the necessary adjustments to bring people on side and to deliver something that was workable. It was necessary to be adaptive, flexible and cooperative and these weren't necessarily Ron's most pronounced traits. The house families were not a part of Ron's original vision but thanks to Kevin Reddy's pioneering efforts they went on to become one of the defining features of the school. As numbers grew so did the pressure on the welfare system. We created additional house coordinators. And John, that's where you came in as our advisor and counselor. And I remember vividly our weekly sessions in my office where we talked about the care of students, the care of staff, and the care of ourselves as well. There were other areas where it was necessary to divert from Ron's blueprint, chiefly in growing the size of the school, which was something he would have opposed. I guess I'm straying off the point now, but in the early years, there was a healthy dialectic between Ron and I that produced a number of key innovations, some to do with structure, some to do with process. So bringing in under structure, things like the order mark system, the student diary, school calendar, if it's not on, it doesn't happen. And under process, what I called participatory democracy, active listening, cajoling, encouragement, positive reinforcement. Ron was the rocket that took the school into outer space. And maybe I was the person that provided the stabilizers and the navigation. Ron was all thrust and fury and power, not always an easy man to work with, but he was a visionary. And his legacy of a school that truly cares for the children lives on. At Foundation Day that first year, Ron said, the very nub of our being at Central Coast Grammar School is pastoral care. Christ said, feed the sheep. My point here, of course, is that this is all what goes towards making a good school. A school is more than the sum of its parts, and it's more than bricks and mortar. It's about people. It's about the founders, Jeff, Len, their partners at the time, Jane and Virginia, Bill Elliott, Graham Bennett, Ed Manners, Pam Passmore, Brian Hilton, Ron and Margaret. You know, Jim Wilson Hogg, our first patron, said, it's so much more exciting to be an ancestor than a descendant. And they were exciting times. But it's also about the disciples. It's about Ron's initial group. Myself, Peter Chudley, Eric Copeland, Kevin Reddy, John Bosenberg. Jill McCarthy, Ros Mort, Peter Brandon, Daryl Ganter, Robin Smith, Ken Gross, Anne Rowland, John Terry, Janet Mudge, Bob Lloyd, Carol Smith, Di Payton, 
Larry Barbecue, Ed McCarthy, Robin Berg, David Newman, Kay Schultz, Cheryl Dennison, John Van Ritten, Norell O'Reilly, Amanda Cawthorn, Graham Bennett, and my old mate Gary Glenn. I could go on for hours about just each one of those names. It's about the leaders, the board chairs, the board members, the heads, senior members of the school team over the years. It's about the followers. It's about the volunteers. So many people have played a part in so many ways. Too many to name for fear of leaving someone out. Some have their names recorded for posterity. And I would like to acknowledge all those who received the Headmaster's Special Award over the years. Their names are all in Anna's history, which is a great record of the work of the school. The scariest moment for me was sitting at a board meeting at 3 by 3 Man Street um, with Bill and Ron and, and the council when I think Bill said, hey look we've talked about this for X number of months and we need to make a decision and take this forward or the school's not going to happen by next year. And, and by the way you each need to put up, I think it was something like $4,000 in or guarantee a loan of $4,000 or something like that. We had to put our money on the line and otherwise it wouldn't happen and I remember thinking, oh, do, do we really do this? So that was probably the scariest moment for me. When my announcement as the headmaster was made by Bill Elliott in the common room, there was a fair amount of hubble bubble. And then I went back to what had always been Ron's office, which was now to be my office. <clears throat> and uh, Ron had a very big polished wooden desk. He never had anything on it. And behind that he had a reclining chair and so I thought, right, I'm now the headmaster. And so I sat in this reclining chair and looked at this big desk and thought about all the wonderful things that I was going to do. And I sat back in the chair and it toppled over backwards. <laughs> so it brought me down to earth in my very first moment as being headmaster. I suppose we all need to practice humility, that's what uh, the Christian message is, but being honest, if I think back, I see now what people tell me is a highly prestigious school. Um, I'm proud of the fact that I was able to bring a whole group of people together who were able to make it what it is today. And I think that uh, I always saw myself as the conductor of the, of the orchestra. Never a great soloist at any particular instrument, but perhaps good at bringing them all together and letting the music be heard. I think it's important in terms of wise words to pass on, it's important that uh, students continue to have a great work ethic and really to keep the, the values that um, have been incorporated over the years into the school. Uh, it's so clear that Central Coast Grammar has so many other, so many great values and there's such a, a tremendous um, vision and ability to help each student with to their own potential and their own abilities and uh, I, I think that just to believe in themselves and to work with their strengths and to, to strive hard with, their, uh, with, with a very strong work ethic, I think, is what I would like to say. So the Central Coast Grammar has now been described as one of the youngest, most pre prestigious schools. What can we pass on to the students today? From a personal point of view, if as a student you have a teacher with passion and enthusiasm that strikes a chord with you that's exciting, Follow it. You can achieve whatever you want to achieve. Your education, to a large extent, starts after school. Look for the passion. Look for the interest while you're at school and follow it later. You'll get there. What immediately springs to mind are the words of Richard Neville when he was our speech night guest when we had our function at St Edward's. And as each prize winner came on stage, he would whisper to them, don't do drugs. Excellent advice, but back to your question, John. I spoke earlier about our original mission statement. 
which was always abbreviated to caring and sharing, but in full, it said striving for excellence in all endeavors in a happy, caring, and supportive environment. So my advice to today's boys and girls is to think about those words. And then some suggestions based on that phrase spring to my mind. Firstly, try your best in academic pursuits, but also in drama, music, sport, or whatever else you're interested in. Secondly, find out what you are interested in and pursue that to the nth degree. Thirdly, be happy. School is a better place if all members of the community try to approach each day with a light heart. And finally, follow the golden rule. And if you don't know what it is, Google it. Look, I think there are some uh, good things to pass on to the students today, if I may. And I actually asked our four children this question uh, about this concept some time ago now, but I asked them what would they be saying to the students of today, bearing in mind they're now in their 30s and late 20s, and I must say they had a wonderful time at the school and made great friends there. But they all said the same thing, interestingly. They said, Mum, what we got out of that school was mostly about the extracurricular activities. What we loved about it was being involved, and they said, for present students, tell them to get involved, have a go, embrace all the opportunities that the school now offers. You know, the music, the drama, uh, the sport, all the different sports they can now play. You know, the, the house families, the clubs, everything that's in, on offer, have a go. Just get involved. Um, because they said sometimes, and for them this was the case, sometimes as a student you might actually find that you have a gift that you didn't know you had. And that gift um, may actually help determine your future career path. Or in plus or minus, it will be an asset for all your life, that gift that you might discover just by having a go at something a little bit different. And so I guess that would be my message for each student, to, to have a go, get involved, and I think you'll be glad you did. So there we have it. We've heard from the pioneers those early years and how hard, how rewarding and how much courage they must have shown and what passion to have achieved the result of a, such a young school becoming so prestigious and so loved and there's still that same passion there. And for that we go back, as Richard Lorney has said, to the early beginnings and Mr. Ron Chambers, he had that passion as the founding um, headmaster and then carried on very humbly, but uh, we all know how much Richard Loyne contributed for those so many years from 1988 through for 20 years and uh, the school flourished in that time. And then since then, we have Mr. Bill Lowe. And it's no mistake, it's no coincidence that that school goes from strength to strength because under Bill's support and leadership, we have a school that's strong in so many areas, that's flourishing in so many directions, that's getting academically the results that are surprising even the parents and on the sporting field, in all avenues of drama, and various things that they do in extracurricular. Bill Lowe has continued that incredible leadership. We're so proud to have become the Archives Committee to celebrate 35 years of this wonderful school and we thank all the headmasters and we again thank Bill Lowe for allowing us the freedom to come together and to appoint an archivist so we are indeed very blessed, have been very blessed, and we hope that this video will continue to enhance the memories and vision of the school as um, we see um, the birth of this wonderful school and its growth, and now it's now being well cared for, and we feel confident it's going to go from strength to strength. Thank you.